decade long period of time with basically zero interest rates. Yeah. That in the history of, you know, modern finance. Like that's the anomaly. Really good point. And when you start to say, okay, so the reason why tech companies in particular have been able to focus less on profit is because in a near zero interest rate environment, investors are willing to look at future profits much more favorably. But once interest rates start going up, the notion of future profits is a lot less attractive than today profits. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Conversations with Leaders, where you can get valuable insights from successful investors and financial leaders worldwide. My name is Sam North, a market analyst here at eToro, and I'm happy to be your host today. Our guest today is Jeff Lawson, co-founder and CEO at Twilio. Twilio enables businesses to know their customers better than any other and is a modern communication API used by developers for establishing communications. It can be used to send SMS, WhatsApp, voice, video, email, and even IoT across the customer journey. Jeff, it's great to have you with us today. How are you? Thank you, Sam. It is great to be here doing well. You're in uh, San Francisco. Amazing. I bet the, the weather there is a lot nicer than than here in London right now. So uh, I'm a bit jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Um, look, we'll, we'll get into it. We've got a, a few questions to to go through, but I guess the best place is always to to start at the beginning. And you started Twilio in 2008, which was a pretty interesting sort of year anyway in financial markets. Can you share some some history about Twilio and, and how it evolved since that beginning? Sure thing. And and as you said, right, we're the leading customer engagement platform today, but that's not how we started the company, right? We started the company in a very different time and and actually kind of with a different set of observations that led us to here. Um, started in 2008. And I think what's really interesting about starting a company during a time like 2008, the financial crisis, or even someone starting a company today, is that ironically, what's going on in the macro environment is at best irrelevant to your young startup and in actually a lot of ways can help your young startup. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit about why I think that, but I'll tell you how I came to start Twilio in 2008. You know, I'm a software developer. I had started three companies before Twilio. Uh, I had been one of the first product managers at Amazon Web Services. And when I left Amazon, I knew I wanted to start my next thing. And so I started looking at a whole bunch of ideas. And I kind of realized that among my three companies I had started previously, very different companies. One was an academic content website during the dot-com era. One of them was uh, StubHub, the uh, uh, online ticketing exchange. Um, and the third was um, a bricks and mortar retailer, of all things, selling extreme sporting goods, skateboards, okay. snowboards, surfboards. And um, I realized that among all three of these very different businesses, we had, number one, a uh, common thread that we are using software to build a better company, a better value proposition, a better product and better customer experience than anyone else in our, you know, competitive set. And our competitive set were mostly like legacy companies that kind of did it the old way. And we said, well, you know, because of software, we can go listen to customers. We can go hear the problem that they have that no one has solved yet. And then with software, we can often go just build that really efficiently, like write some code, upload it to the internet and like, boom, we've solved someone's problem. And if we do that well, we're going to start to win the hearts, minds, and wallets of these customers who are sitting here saying, look, uh, there's a problem in the world today that no one's solved yet. And that's the fundamental act of every startup um, that uses software. And that's the fundamental ability of software, right? This idea that you can listen to a customer, turn it into a prototype quickly, push that out uh, and get feedback and constantly iterate week over week, sprint over sprint, making your product and your experience better and better because you're able to take customer feedback and and have this tight loop, that is the thing that makes software amazing. And now you can do it at unprecedented scale because of the efficiency of the internet, right? If you solve the right problem, you can solve that problem for billions of people around the world. How amazing is that? Yeah, like the world has never seen scale of creation that you now have because of the internet. It used to be that if you made a something like a chair, it's like, great, 20 people would, would <laughs> use it in the lifetime of the chair, right? Now you can create something and billions of people can use this creation that you made. All And all you have to do is type in some magical codes into a computer um, and click the upload button. So that's the first thing. And the second thing that I realized, though, at every one of those companies was that we essentially needed to pull together this like understanding of our customer and then use that to, to talk to our customer in some way. 
And we had very different ways that that manifested between three very different businesses. But every one of those, it always ended up in the same thing. It was like, God, I wish I could text the customer when this happens. God, I wish I could personalize our marketing. I, God, I wish I, our website could adapt to who they are. I, like there are all these needs that we had. And every time we looked at it, we're like, yeah, but the technology doesn't do that, right? Like, first of all, if we're trying to like make a phone ring or, or send a text message, you're like, great. I, who, I, do I look like AT&T to you? No, I like, you know, I don't know how that works. And then the second one was like, yeah, but I've got all these applications that have a piece of the data about my customer and trying to stitch that, the, all those pieces of data together so that I can actually like join the knowledge about my customer into one view was so incredibly hard because you have all these systems that are all speaking different languages that all have different identifiers that all have are running at different cadences. And when you try to do like the, the weekly batch update of this system and that system and that system, it's like, it's always failing. It never works. And so started Twilio to really solve this problem of, of saying like, great, how can we enable the software people of the world who are building companies, both in the legacy world, who are transforming with digital transformation, the biggest, oldest companies that are out there are getting reborn, but also all the young companies that are starting and saying, we're going to use this power of software, mobile, internet, all this kind of stuff to go build uh, new ideas. How can we empower them with the right technology to be able to solve this whole category of problems that ultimately lets you build a great customer relationship? And that's where Twilio started. So we started in 2008 and where we started was in communications. Our first product was our voice product. Then we added our messaging product that allows a, a software company to send and receive text messages with anyone in the world. And we just kept building out from there. And the, and you know the reason why I said, I think that the macro environment is not that big a deal for like a young startup. Yeah, having started Twilio in 2008, because I remember at the time, a lot of people asked me like, well, are you worried about the economy? <laughs> yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, the economy? No, I'm just worried that like, there's no, like, I'm not solving a problem anyone has. Like, that's the thing I'm worried about. Um, I'm worried about obscurity, that I solved a, a problem that everybody has and no one knows about me, right? Those are the problems of a startup, as opposed to uh, the like interest rates, you know, or whatever, because you know, when you're starting at scale zero, you know, you're just not affected by what's going on in the macro sense. Cause all you're trying to do is get from zero to one. There's somebody out there with your problem. Yeah. And you just have to find them. And it's not like the, you know, the macro economy really changes that for you. But what I, um, the other thing I said, like at best it's neutral, but in a lot of ways, I think actually an economy like this is better for startups. I was about um, to say that is, is almost like a really good time actually. And then we fast forward five years, we'll look back at certain startups and think, oh, it makes sense what they did. I think we will for two reasons. One is, you know, just a lot of the competition walks away from a market like this, like, um, you know, think about the era of time after the dot com crash of 2001 to like 2007 yeah. or whatever. It was like a lot of the people who weren't really interested in like building great companies and focusing on customers and building technology, they were just in it because everything was up into the right yeah. during the dot com yeah. era. Like they just were like, all right, never mind. I'm going to go to the to, to the next industry where everything feels easy, mortgages or whatever, right? <laughs> and and, but the people were really dedicated, the people who really wanted to do the work and were excited about it, they're the ones who stayed. And so I think you are probably going to see maybe a similar period of time again. The other thing that I would say though, is if you think about the act of, of creating something with technology, whether it's a startup or even a new project inside of a bigger company, you're there to solve a problem for a customer that no one has yet solved, right? That's the fundamental act of creating value in the world, right? And a period of time like this, where the world is getting turned upside down creates problems, right? As I'm sure everybody yeah, knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now there's a whole category of new problems that no one has solved because they're brand new. There's your opportunity. Yeah, yeah. You get to go in and say, great, there's all these problems the world has. How can I solve them? Yeah. And, and, that and, I, and I was saying, and I guess if, if, if a company can demonstrate that they can survive that and build a company in that environment, that's amazing, right? Yeah, well, in a, in a stagnant world where like the same problems have largely existed for the last 10 years, what are the chances that someone else has already started figuring out how to solve those mm. and then gone in and sold their solution and done whatever? But in a world where the problems are evolving, that's just like fertile soil for anybody with the ability and the desire to go understand those problems and go solve them because 
that's that's I mean that's the you know necessity is the mother of invention, right? And so when the necessities change, that spawns a lot of innovation. That's why I think this period of time and any period of time where there's a lot of change going on in the world is is actually not bad for startups. It's actually mm -hmm. that fertile ground for the folks who have the conviction who want to go in to do it. Yeah, I think that's massively important. I mean, let's let's take a little trip to sort of the investor side of things, and you know, how should investors or potential investors think about Twilio's main proposition and competitive advantage? And and there is there any unique moat towards it around it? Well, so if you think about what Twilio does, um, which I think is particularly relevant for a time like this. What we do is we help companies, particularly B2C companies with huge customers, uh, internet scale businesses, and we help them to better understand their customers so that they can go build stronger relationships with those customers. Now, um, and the way to do this is with technology, right? You, this is not like a one-to-one -one relationship kind of thing. This is a story of really leveraging technology very smartly to go understand millions, tens of millions, or hundreds of millions of people in order to personalize everything that you say and do for each one of those customers to make them uh, more happy, loyal, repeat customers. And what I think about in this is you think about the companies who have actually done a really good job of this for the past 10, 15, 20 years, right? And you think about the digital giants, you think about Amazon, yeah. you think about Google, you think about Netflix, right? You think about these companies that have taken reams and reams of data and built an understanding of us as their customers. And as a result of that, they are able to personalize every touch point we have with them. And that's why, you know, my Amazon homepage and your Amazon homepage are completely different. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, my, you know, I search for something on Google. You can search for the exact same thing on Google yet get very different search results yeah. based on who they, what they know about us, Incredible. where we live, what time of day it is, what type of stuff we've clicked on in the past and we're interested in. Those are all opportunities for them to make their product better for us. And what happens when they do that? We say, thank you. And like, we use those products more because they feel more relevant to us. When I need a new pair of shoes, you're like, well, yeah, I bet Amazon will give me great recommendations. Let me yeah. go to amazon.com, right? Well, that's because they have brilliantly used every click, every scroll, everything we've looked at and clicked on, everything we've looked at and not clicked on, everything we've bought, everything we've returned, everything we haven't bought, right? All of those things are data points that tell them how they can better personalize uh, what they do for us. Now, I think about every other company out there, they've got a problem. Because if they let Amazon, Google, et cetera, build this relationship with us where everything I need to buy, I go to Amazon first. Everything I want to know, I go to Google first. Yeah. Then those companies are in control of the customer and you have to go pay them on a per transaction basis in order to continue to stay in business, right? You have to pay, you have to buy ads on Google to continually yeah, yeah, yeah. rebuy your own customers even though they're already your customer, if they think you go to Google, <laughs> right, first, then you have to like, great, I got to buy ads. And like, think about it. Companies have to buy their own name on Google, right? And then Amazon, like, obviously, that's a transactional platform, right? You have to continue paying the cut of every transaction to Amazon if you're selling on Amazon. So what I hear from company after company that I talk to, and we have almost 300,000 customers across every industry, every size, from startups to the Fortune 100s in every industry, you know, financial services, retail, hospitality, real estate, you name it. It's like everybody. And what I hear them say is like, look, I have got to know my customer and build a relationship with my customer that is unbreakable. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I have to pay a percentage of my top line to one of the tech giants, and I can't afford to do that. That's existential for my company. And so we are helping all those companies to do that by bringing a lot of the same technologies that like tech giants have figured out how to use and actually help companies with a platform that enables them to get as good at those giants at understanding their customer with the story of data and then using that data to engage with the customer better across their sales and marketing, across their inside their product, across their service and support, across every touch point that they have with that customer, 
uh, to provide them. And we call this a customer engagement platform. And at the core of it is every communications medium that companies use from voice, messaging, chat, email, et cetera, um, and uh, customer data. So we have the leading communications platform. If investors know about that market as uh, CPaaS, communications platform as a service, we're the leading CPaaS company. Then the other side is an acquisition we did several years ago called Segment, which is the leading customer data platform. That category is called CDP, and we're the leader in that. And what we're doing now is putting it together and creating what is really this new category, which is the combination of understanding your customer and communicating with them, which is called customer engagement. So we wrap that core of data and communications with the apps that companies use to um, to drive those communications. So we have a marketing app for the marketers called Twilio Engage. We have the contact center app for the service and salespeople called uh, Twilio Flex. We have yes. a uh, an app for the mobile worker called Twilio Frontline. And then we've got an identity uh, verification solution. So you have to know who the customer is called Verify. And those four apps kind of wrap the core. And what's neat about it is that as customers invest in this platform, the whole platform gets better for them. So if you think about the more data that is going into segment, the smarter your marketing campaigns and your customer acquisition can be, but that also makes your contact center smarter because uh, you can now surface better, more insightful data for a contact center agent. Uh, the more communications you do in terms of like notifications, alerts, things like that using our core platform, well, the more data we collect about more engagement and therefore the smarter your marketing can be. And so there's a nice virtuous cycle between when you do a better job of understanding your customers, you can drive more impactful, more engaging communications. And the, when you do that, when people are willing to come to your site, go to your mobile app, click yeah. around, that generates more data, which makes you smarter about how to engage with them. And so there's a very nice virtuous cycle here that we're building for our customers, which is the data that feeds the engagement, which feeds in, therefore more data. How many um, sort of cust- well, you mentioned how many customers there and companies use it. How many sort of on the developing side now? How many developers use Twilio? Because obviously Twilio software allows users with little to no coding experience. So basically, someone like me maybe <laughs> to, to easily write a program. I mean, is this simplicity key? Is that really what it's all about? It, what it's about is giving customers the ability to say yes to things that they used to have to say no to. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, when I think about technology, what's amazing is like software, anything's possible. It, it's like arranging magnetic particles on hard drives. Like that's the fundamental act of writing software. And like you go talk to a software developer, it's like anything's possible. Yeah. The question is, is there business value in doing it? And do we build the right thing? Did we solve the right problem? And so my belief is that what we need to do is enable every company to quickly answer the question of, is this worth building? And the way you often do that is by starting with a relatively quick prototype of an idea and putting it in front of a small number of customers and getting that feedback and then iterating your way towards what is right. And so to me, the key isn't um, just that it's easy. And I think it is easier than ever to build software. Um, but actually the key thing is how, how can you enable that agility and that speed so that you can turn an idea? What if we did this into the insight from a customer that says that's amazing or eh, nah, no, thank you. Um, that's the key. You want to shorten the cycle time between an idea and the feedback that tells you if that idea was any good. And by the way, a lot of times you can do that without writing any software at all. You just go talk to enough customers and you get a yeah. sense for what is value. That's the first step. But then actually, once you build it, then you start to get the real feedback. So um, what we want to do is shorten that cycle time. And so like you said, you know, do you need developers to do it? Um, I think that companies that are winning in the digital economy are companies that do employ software developers, yes. Because ultimately, if the interface a company has with its customers is rapidly becoming a digital interface, then the way companies differentiate is by building the better digital interface. So what do I mean by that? Think about your bank. 30 years ago, you said you you liked your bank if they had enough parking in their parking lot. <laughs> And if the if if it was a right, well, uh, sorry, this is a very North American sense. Well, whatever, I'll say it anyway. <laughs> if it was a if it was a right hand turn on your way home from work okay. to get into the bank, I'll translate this into uh, into British for you. If it's a left hand, left hand, yes. 
<laughs> to get into like, right you're like oh i like my bank right yeah. like that's like nowadays your bank isn't even a physical place anymore yeah, it's an exactly. app on your phone and you like your bank if they've adopted the new like you know face unlock feature of your phone if the app is fast if it doesn't crash and if periodically they're like hey here's a new capability you can you know sh- split a bill with your friends at dinner you're like oh great i like my app i, I like my I like my bank i like my app i like my <laughs> bank which is an app and that's when so that is the fundamental act of, of of building software that solves problems um but we have a lot of different ways that our customers use Twilio. we have like you know, a full development platform. We have a low code solution. We have a no code solution, right? So there's a lot of ways that our customers use Twilio. Uh, at the core is more code. And then as you get towards the outer parts of our customer engagement platform, you get more, more apps, like contact center app, yeah. a marketing app that are very much customizable with low code, no code, and what I call yo code uh, approaches. But ultimately the whole platform is there to accelerate your ability to take an idea and to turn it into reality and then repeat that and do it at enterprise scale with global um, global reach and uh, enterprise reliability. And that's the whole idea. We can accelerate abilities of companies to execute in this digital world. Yeah. I'm listening to how passionate you are about just sort of knowing the customer and uh, and achieving their their needs. I imagine the answer, well, I can't really imagine why a company would do what I'm about to say, but is there a risk that uh, some of the larger customers that you work with may think, you know what, let's build our own in-house solutions? You know, if so, you know, how would you deal with this and other potential risks? Is it a case of, you know, you have to have like meetings around this strategies in place or is it part and parcel of running a business? Well, you know, I think the same question can be asked of like any B2B company, right? Because right. the fundamental promise of the cloud is and has always been, hey, take this part of what you do as a company and let us do it for you. Yes. Because we are going to do it better than you can yeah, do it yourself. It. And we're going to do it better than any of our competition. That's always been the promise of the cloud because like, think about you know, infrastructure as a service, you know, what Amazon and, and Microsoft with Azure and Google cloud, like that world, you know, companies had servers before, before AWS came around, but they said, no, no, no. If you outsource this to us, we're going to do a better job. We're going to be more efficient. We are going to um, uh, run them uh, better with greater uptime. We're going to give you more flexibility. You can flex up, you can flex down. We are basically more competent at this than you are. And if you believe yeah. that, then you should buy us. If you don't, then you won't, right? And so and you take the whole cloud ecosystem is companies who've said, we're going to specialize in this one part of building value. And companies, our customers are going to say, you know what? Yeah, I do believe. Like we've, for anything that anyone in the cloud does, there's probably been someone who's tried it inside of companies and it's a subscale investment. It's a small team. And the value of the cloud is a whole company, thousands of people out there doing this one thing that inside your company, maybe like a dozen people trying to figure it out. And, and that's why the cloud is so powerful is because it allows companies to pay by the drip for things that used to be like huge investments, large teams. Yeah. And oftentimes those teams failed to deliver because in some ways the, the customer vendor relationship formalizes the notion of what success or failure looks like. It's like, if you do a good job, we keep paying you. If you do a bad job, we will switch to your competitor. That is very clarifying mm. versus internal teams where there usually is no competitor. Yeah. So you could like say like, well, you know, your performance is okay or something like that, but it's like, you can keep firing people, I, I suppose, <laughs> right? Like, I don't know. It's just the vendor customer relationship just really formalizes. This is what great looks like. This is how you measure success. It's called revenue and profit and go. And that's why competitive dynamics work so well in the cloud that has made every company so much more efficient as they've adopted the cloud than when they were trying to do everything themselves. Yeah, the proof is in the, in the pudding. Uh, Twilio has been active in the M&A space over the last few years. Can you talk through why these were important for the company? And is this part of the growth strategy going forward? So m a is is like it's a tool in the toolkit. It is not a part of our growth strategy in okay. terms of like buying revenue and growth. I know there's some companies that that do that. Um, that's not how we think about it. How we think about m a is we have this product that we're building and this market that we're 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 building towards this customer engagement platform. And so we've got a you know a nice long roadmap of things that we think this platform uh, entails, and we can build it. But when we see a company out there who's already built a meaningful part of it, 
is doing well in the market as great team, great technology, um, and even potentially some market traction, we'd say, well, we could go build it and then go compete with them, or we could just buy them and accelerate our uh, path towards our uh, realizing our vision. And so that's when you look at, um, you know, our big, uh, you know, we've done two large um m a deals actually three i'd say um and they're all basically part of that story which is how are we accelerating our path towards unlocking this customer engagement vision so segment which is the most recent large acquisition we've done you know they were the leader in customer engagement uh sorry in uh in, in cdp customer data platforms and this is a really hard technical problem to solve you know to ingest in real time the volume of events that they do and then to, in real time, turn it into insights on a per human basis, per customer basis, that is a really hard technical problem to solve. There's very few teams in the world who have done that. I'll give you an example. One of our customers for segment is Fox Sports. Yeah. They use us to instrument their website and mobile apps during the Super Bowl because it's their one time a year when like so many more people come to that website or that app. And yeah. they're trying to understand who everyone is so that they can actually learn how to engage with you better and turn you into a, a regular customer of theirs, oh, yes. not just a, a, yeah. a customer for a few hours. And um, <clears throat> during the Super Bowl, they've publicly talked about how Segment ingested over a million events a second. Wow. That is huge scale. That's every second, a million events, and then That's turning insane. them into customer insights, right? That is a huge technology achievement. No one else can say that. There's other mm. companies out there with CDPs that claim to have real time. And you're like, when you read the fine print, real time equals 12 hours later. You're like, I'm not sure. <laughs> not Hoping sure no that. one reads it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Um, this is truly real time, truly internet scale. And we just said, look, this is the best technology out there. We should buy it instead of trying to go build it and playing catch up with them because everybody's been playing catch up with them for years. Um, and so that's how I think about M&A is when there's someone who's clearly got a great lead in the market where it's key to what we want to do. Great. Let's bring them in and let's go accelerate our joint ability to unlock this vision together. Have, have, have you got like a, a favorite uh, sort of uh, company that you brought in or is that like asking a parent what your favorite child is? Uh, yeah, it's definitely like that. <laughs> but I would say it's... Um, you know, I just think that we, we've we've brought in some amazing uh, companies into Twilio for to be part of our mission. But yeah. I think the most strategic for us, so this isn't favorite, it's just strategic, is segment. Right. Because with customer data, that really is the brain of, of any company. And so with segment, what I think we really did is bring in the ability to be a, a much smarter solution for our customers because we have that that brain inside of Twilio, uh, as opposed to relying on some other part of our customer stack to be the smarts, and we are um, transiting the communication, which is more like the arms and legs, if you will, if I want to continue this weird metaphor. Um, <laughs> it's like, you know, how do you touch a customer? It's with communications, with, yeah. you know, t- messaging, it's with email, it's with whatever. But what are you saying? What are you doing? That's the brain. You know, why is this the right thing to say at the right moment? Why is Why are you sending this particular communication or why are you answering it with this? That is all about the intelligence. And so with Segment, we are bringing the intelligence to the table. And that's why I think Segment is the most strategic deal that we've done. Got you. Um, I mean, look, we're at the the back end of, of 2022, and we've actually talked already about tough macro environments, you mentioned a few periods in, in history there, the dot-com, the great financial crisis, and the sort of the end of this sort of uh, low rate environment. So yeah, look, it's been a tough period. Um, what impact have you seen during this period for Twilio? And if conditions improve next year, uh, how are you set to take advantage of a more favorable environment, should there be one? Well, the way I think about it, the last 10 to whatever, almost 14 years of near zero interest rates mm-hmm. are are the anomaly. Yes. Okay. You know, when things started correcting like late last year, early this year, it was like at first everyone looked at it like, oh, well, this is an anomaly, right? You know, re- multiples are coming down. I'm sure they'll be back to where they were. But then you kind of look at it and you're like, well, wait a minute. A decade long period of time with basically zero interest rates. Yeah. That in the history of, you know, modern finance, like that's the anomaly. Really good point. And when you start to say, okay, so the reason why tech companies in particular have been able to focus less on profit is because in a near zero interest rate environment, investors are willing to look at future profits much more favorably. 
But once interest rates start going up, the notion of future profits is a lot less attractive than today profits. And that's why so much pressure has come on tech companies who either don't get don't make a lot of profit or don't make any profit to say, you got to get there now. And so as a public company CEO, I feel that pressure because Twilio hasn't been profitable. And so that's why we committed to our investors that starting in 2023, we will be non-GAAP profitable for uh, for the year 2023 and then add additional leverage every year thereafter. And, you know, and it makes sense to me that in this environment now that the the time for profits, you know, has arrived and we're now a $4 billion revenue company. So you're like, yeah, at this scale, can we be profitable? Sure. But I also think that um, the promise of tech has always been the ability to go build large scale global businesses more efficiently than anyone else. Because you have, you know, basically the, the core act is writing code and uh, like <laughs> and uploading it to the internet. And if you build the right thing, you can reach an audience of billions of people. Yeah. And that's unprecedented in the history of software, like I said earlier, right? And so the idea behind tech has been, let's go do that. Let's go build our audience of, you know, as many people as we can, or for a B2B company like Twilio, as many businesses as we can. And, you know, at some point, maybe the music will stop in terms of like getting the ability to go invest and like, you know, either not make a lot of profit or to even lose money. And when it does, the folks who have reached the greatest scale and of the strongest um, customer bases are in the best position to go continue. And I think you saw that in the dot-com era, right? There were a bunch of joker businesses back then and, the, <laughs> and those and those disappeared, but the real businesses like Amazon, survived. Or eBay yeah. or whatever, like survived. And went on and focused on more on profitability than they had historically um, and continued to serve their customers and are now some of the behemoths of our time. And and I think there's a similar thing that you look at uh, today, which is, you know, yep, the music has stopped in terms of getting the ability to go invest more freely. Makes sense why? Because of interest rates. And now companies uh, across the tech industry, uh, including Twilio, are retooling for Definitely. an era of profit as opposed to the of the era of of kind of market capture and growth. And that is what it is. And I think that um, you'd be foolish to say that's unexpected. Of course, at some point that's going to happen. The question is when and are you are you able to make that transition? And do you realize it quickly enough? And that's so that's the mode that we and so many other tech companies are in, which is great. We now we have to undergo that transition from growth with a, an eye on profit to profit with growth or profitable growth, as I like to say it. And, you know, for tech companies and software companies in particular, you look at the rule of 40 as giving you the the guideline for how to do that. And the rule of 40 says, basically, you can take your um, year over year growth plus free cash flow margin and add those together and they should equal 40 or better. And this is the regression that investors use or they don't use. It's like a regression that shows investor behavior where companies that are at that 40 or higher mark get premium EV to revenue multiples. Um, and companies that are low below that mark are, you know, get marked down. And so you can trade off growth if you're growing at 40% year over year, you can still probably get away with, you know, little to no profit. If you're only growing at 20% a year, then you probably should show about 20% free cash flow margin. And you know, this has continued to hold true. I think that now the if you look at the data, it starts to skew a little more towards the profit side of that equation versus the growth side. But look, there are still some software companies out there that are growing at elevated rates um, and are not yet uh, free cash flow positive, and they're still rewarded by investors. And so I still think growth is valued, but it's just the equation has started to tip uh, more clearly towards profit. Yeah. I mean, you also made a very good point there about your, your Amazons, your Apples that survived that period. I mean, I think it was one point and I could be wrong to the percent, but I think Amazon lost its uh, share price by about 90%. And then obviously since that bottom has gone on hundreds of thousands since then, uh, I, I yeah, must like, confess. I, I, was, I, joined, I joined Amazon in 2004, um, got issued some RSUs at, you know, I think $20. Yeah, you know, a couple of weeks after I arrived, they had their an earnings call, and I think they dropped to like fifteen dollars. And everyone was like, "Oh my, oh my!" And you know, Jeff and the team were like, "Look, we're investing for the long term." Yeah. Um, there's obviously going to be noise uh, in the short yes. term. And what was interesting is that I was working at AWS at the time, and I looked at it outside of those walls in 2004. Nobody knew that AWS existed. Ah. 
right? Making a big investment in, in, in this thing called AWS that outside those walls, they're like, why is this company losing money? They can never make money. Look how much money they lose. I'm like, no, he's investing in really smart technology here. Yeah. Um, makes sense to me. And sure enough, now AWS is the thing that buoys the whole company practically. So it's like, you know, sometimes you have to make some bets and those bets will not be fully understood by investors because, you know, you're, you're not ready to talk about them yet or the returns yes. haven't been realized yet. Um, but that's the act of actually uh, of actually inside of a company. I'm also an investor. As a CEO, I'm an investor. Trying yes, to decide so, how am I investing the company's funds in future growth? Yeah. So just on that, with like look, share prices in, in 2020 for a lot of companies went higher and then have recently come lower. So for you seeing that, do you say to yourself, well, I'm not going to get ca too carried away on the way up and on the way down, I believe in the business and using that Amazon example, it's, it, you know, that's how you see it and how you can sort of ride through this, this period. Yes. With a caveat uh -huh. in prior periods of time, like we've been public since 2016. Yeah. And in that period of time, there's been the various ups and downs, right? As yeah. you can imagine. And in those periods of time, the thing that I told myself and I told the whole company, it was like, look, there are going to be ups and downs. Um, that's what it is to be a public company. Yeah. You, know, you can have a good quarter or a bad quarter, but ultimately we look at the long term and we are focused on our customers first and foremost. And that's the way to build value in the world by building for customers. Um, the caveat that I give to that though, is that the current is a bit different because you do have this fundamental change in interest rates. Yes. Therefore in the reward function of companies, how companies are valued. In that world, you can't say, look, just ignore this. This is noise. We're just going to keep doing it, everything as usual. You do need to say, well, look, the fundamentals of the macro economy have changed in a way that changes how um, investors value equities. And we do have to take that into our, our understanding of the world and, and therefore how we're running the company. And so, I, you know, there are changes that are going on inside of, of not just Twilio, but I think every company and not even in tech, just every company, company yeah. to focus more on profit. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's just a function of the environment that you're, you're in. You, know, you have to be cognizant of the, you know, the, 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 the lake that you're swimming in, right? When the conditions change, you got to change along with it. Um, and I think that's what's going on in the world right now. So there's a bit of a reconfiguration um, and that's fine. It's forcing more discipline for companies um, to go find profit, find efficiency in places where maybe two years ago they weren't as focused. That's healthy. And so that's what we're doing. Um, that's the one change I would say that to the status quo, but the core message does remain, right? We do have yeah. to continue to focus on our customers um, through this. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, and, and just a quick one before we go on to our last couple of questions. So you, you wouldn't allow yourself to get carried away, for example, the week of the, the 5th of March in, in 2020, when the share price went 60% higher, you wouldn't get to the Friday and think, oh, let me just pour a, a quick glass of champagne to celebrate. You wouldn't, you wouldn't allow yourself to do that. Look, you never pour yourself champagne <laughs> when the share price goes up because- what are you going to do when the share price goes down? <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. And, you know, I always tell my team and the company, it's like, look, if the share price goes up by 20% in a day, like, are we 20% smarter today than we were yesterday? Mm. Are we 20% better than we were yesterday? In the same way, when it goes down 20%, i am like, are we 20% dumber yeah, than we were yeah, yesterday? Yeah. Like, like, that doesn't make sense. And, you know, there's the old... I think it's attributed to Warren Buffett, but I think maybe even he stole it from, you know, the whole thing like in the short term, you know, the stock market is a voting machine, but in the yeah, long yeah, term, yeah, it's yeah. a weighing machine. Yeah. I find that most employees don't really understand what that means. And so I, I've kind of modernized it. I've breakfast clubbed it. I say, you know, in the short term, it's a popularity contest in the long term. It's a talent show. Yes. I love that. A little more accessible metaphor, maybe for the modern uh, audience, but um, you know, I think that's true. Right. And so the, the thing that I always think about is, and you actually, I told the company this right after we went public because we went public, uh, you know, our, our last private round valuation had been about a billion dollars. I think the share price was like $8 at our last private round. We went public. Uh, I think our, 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 our share, our, our offering was at 16 bucks. The first day mm -hmm. we traded up to like 30 within two weeks, we were at like 60. I mean, it was like, and everyone, of course, everyone's like, yay. And I was like, <laughs> I remember an all hands meeting where I just like, I wanted to tamp this down a bit because I just wanted my employees to be able to take all this stuff in stride. And it's a real, it's a real mind blow when a company goes public where yeah, yeah. for your employees for a long time, the only thing they ever heard about was when your share price went up. 
because mm. you typically would raise a round when you got an attractive valuation from investors. And so you would go to your employees and say, guess what? We raised a round and your share price is now double what it used to be. And everyone's like, yay. Now suddenly you go public and it goes up and down, which is like, you're like, oh wait, it can go down too. Yeah, it can go down. <laughs> and so, and so I was trying to set the expectation for employees of like, well, yeah. you know, we got to take this in stride. And I just said, you know, it took us uh, eight years to build uh, $1 billion in value. Mm-hmm. Does it make sense? And that was an $8 share price. And suddenly we were trading at 60. I'm like, does it make sense that we would um, build like build the next $8 billion of value in two weeks? <laughs> like, does that intellectually, like, does that seem possible? And people kind of thought about it. They're like, I remember this all hands meeting. I'm standing in front of the whole company. And then I saw people like, they're like, yeah, uh, that's, that's a bit weird. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, so this click. I'm like, I can't tell you what the share price is going to be. Yeah, but I can tell you to not get too attached to any particular number because if it took eight years to build the first billion, why in two weeks would we build <laughs> you know eight times that value? It's hard hard to intellectualize. You know, yeah, I mean that would be the dream, wouldn't it? Um, every company has its unique metrics, and I guess from an investing standpoint, and those that people that are interested in in investing or have invested or are going to in the future. So, so when investors. Uh, looking to sort of evaluate a company and its intrinsic value, what would you say is important for them to focus on when looking at Twilio? Well, I mean, it's the metrics that we that we publish, basically, yeah. is the, yeah. are the ones I, I are probably ought to be pointing to. Um, so we publish, <laughs> obviously, uh, you know, we've obviously published our revenue numbers, <laughs> of course. Um, the one, he, I'm actually going to tell you the number to not focus on. And we just, ta- we just okay. talked about this in our last um, Investor Day. You know, some of the non, non-GAAP numbers that we publish are like our DBNE, our dollar-based net expansion rate, which has been historically very strong. Um, we have said we're going to start publishing our software revenue number, which is the like the next uh, kind of wave of the company's of, of our company's story is about building and selling software that uh, constitutes the major apps that companies buy. So our marketing uh, software, our um, uh, contact center software, et cetera. And so we've really told investors, hey, like you should look at the next era of Twilio, the next act that we're building as a success of software. And we're going to start showing you that number. So you should look at it. The number I'm, I would say not to look at, strangely, is investors have been very focused on gross margin percentage. And look, I, I understand why, right? It's obviously a, an indicator of future um, ability to generate profit. But I think there's a unique aspect in our messaging business, which is a large at scale business. Um, where it's a structurally lower gross margin than software products, but our take we pay a portion of our revenues to carriers, which is a carrier fees. Carriers set these fees that can go higher, they can go lower, and we pass it through to customers. And you know, uh, investors have looked at that and said, when the carrier fees are higher and we pass it through to customers, our gross margin comes down and said, oh wow, oh this is bad. I'm like, that's not the way we run the company. The way we run the company is like, look, we add value on top of the carrier fees. In terms of our software platform, at our recent analyst day, we showed that, look, our um, gross profit per message has been stable or increased over the past two years, while our gross margin percentage has actually declined quite a bit. And our investors have been like, oh, my God, the gross margin percentage is declining. We're like, that's just because the carrier fees went up. We pass it through to customers. Our gross margin, like our profit per message, what we take, has been constant or and even increased. And internationally, it has increased by 25% over two years. So you're like, that's good. We should keep selling those messages all day, every day, and not wring our hands of, oh my God, gross profit percentage is going down. Um, because what you care about is your ability to generate gross profit dollars that you can ultimately invest or drop to the bottom line. And so that's how we're thinking about it. And so we use the opportunity of our recent analyst day to try to like reframe the story of why gross margin percentage isn't the main line everyone should focus on. You should really look at for our communications business, the gross margin dollars that we're throwing off. And we should be measured on how efficiently we're able to do that. So everything below the gross profit line. So how are we managing OPEX? How are we managing efficiency? How much can we drop to our non-GAAP profit of op margin? And then ultimately in the fullness of time, our GAAP profitability, that's what we're focused on. That's what I think investors really care about and so that's what investors should focus on as well. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. And I guess that communication is, is super helpful for, for investors. Yeah. Jeff, our, our last question, and there's no way. I, I think you've said that four times. <laughs> I know. Yeah, well, it is. I'm, I've, I've, I've learned a lot this one. And I've actually got rule of 40 underlined here for, for more research purposes. Um, I couldn't go through this interview without our final question. Uh, this Friday is England versus USA in the FIFA World Cup. I don't know if you're a soccer fan, but I want a prediction right now um <laughs> you know I, i'm embarrassed to say i'm like not much of a, a football fan but yes uh, <laughs> I, you know likewise i will ask you for a prediction this uh saturday is the michigan versus ohio state football game what's your prediction okay i will go for the underdogs whoever they are in the last <laughs> minute <laughs> likewise i will go for the underdogs in your sport whatever they are Jeff, thank you very much for today uh, and this interview. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. It's been great to be here. Thank you.